Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time today, Lord. We thank you for your glory and your presence in our lives, Lord. Lord, at the sound of my voice, I ask that you would just touch every heart today. Lord, the things and the cares and the anxieties of this world that are on people's mind, Lord, help them to, to come to nothing, Lord, compared to you. Because we know when we keep our eyes on the blesser and we, we don't worry about the blessings, that we know that everything comes full circle in our lives. Everything that we need, you say that you will supply all of our needs according to your glorious riches, Lord. So we glory in your presence right now, Lord. We don't want to think about anything else except for you. We are here to honor and praise you, Jesus. And Lord, I, as I come to this pulpit, Lord, and I give this word today, Lord, I take myself away from here, and I ask that you would pour into me, and none of me would be up here but all of you, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing to your sight, Lord Jesus. So just touch us all, Lord. We need a touch from you today, Jesus. We're here for a touch. We're not here. This is not a social club, Jesus. This is where we come to honor you, Lord. This is where we come to be rejuvenated and revived. Lord, we know that you are our source, and we're here for you. So bless us all, Lord. Help us. We need you. We need you. We need you. And we honor you and glorify you in holy name today. And it's in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody say amen. Praise God. First of all, I want to thank Pastor Roger Warmer for having me here today. Give him a hand. He's an all you guys have an awesome, awesome leader here, him and his wife, Penny. And I want to thank my wife. By the way, it was her birthday Friday. <laughs> we threw a surprise birthday party, but I want to thank her because without her, I wouldn't be able to do anything, anything without her. She's just so special to me. So we're going to jump right into the message today. We are going to be talking about compromise. And the reason why I want to focus on compromise today, because I feel that in today's society, in the church, that compromise has crept up in the church. Now, we can understand compromise in the world, but in the church, when we compromise, it can be deadly. And what's taken control of, of some churches is that the value of truth, there has been an attack on the integrity of God's word, and that attack is the spirit of compromise. Now, if you have your Bible, turn with me to Psalms chapter 119, verses 1 through 3. 1 through 3. And mine is taken out of the NLT, but it doesn't matter what you have, as long as it's the, the authoritative word of God. Praise God. Psalms chapter 19, verses 1 through 3. And he says, joyful are people of integrity. My, my, my. My, my, my. Who follows the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. And watch this. This is the, this is the, the, the key scripture I want to key in on today. It says that they do not compromise with evil. My, in this world, how have so many people compromised with evil and minimized things and call them something else, but really it's evil. The Bible says that we're going to come to a time where good is going to be called evil and evil is going to be called good. How many people know that we're in that time right now? And it's all because of compromise. And it's crept, it's creeping into the church. And he goes on to say, he says, they do not compromise with evil and they walk only in his paths. Only in his paths. Now, I don't care what the, what the world says about certain things, but if it's not the path of God, then it's the path of the devil. Brother Steve touched on that today. He talked about if it's, if it's not godly, then it's of the enemy. See, we've straddled the fence too long. And we need to get back to the place where we're completely submitted to God. 
and we're depending on him and leaning on him and we hear from him to see the right way to go instead of the wrong way because broad is the way that a lot of people are going, but narrow is the way to eternal life. So when I, I wanna talk about integrity. And when I looked up the word integrity, it was in the Hebrew, it was pretty interesting. It says blameless, it says full, perfection, flawless. In the Webster's it described it like this. It says it's the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness, honesty, uprightness, honor, ethics, morals, virtue, truthfulness, trustworthiness. Wow, that's a lot of stuff that has just went right down the drain today in the day of society. And what I believe is, like I said earlier, I believe that the church, we moved away um, from integrity. Now I can recall back in the day because my grandmother raised me and uh, we used to have, does anybody remember like the insurance guy that used to come out to the house? Do you guys remember that? We had the insurance guy, he would come out and I remember peeking in and listening to my grandmother's conversations and stuff with them. And I used to listen to how they would talk about uh, payments and agreements and things of that nature. And I can recall back then that there was really no use for contracts and signatures and things like that. They would shake the, each other's hands and it was their word. Because back then, people kept their word. The word meant something. And so the, the one thing that I really want us all to understand and see that our words have integrity behind them. And, most of, and, and back then, their words had integrity behind them. And if they said it, most of the time you can bank on it and you can agree with it and it's settled. But in a greater way, we have to understand that God's word is the same, but it holds perfection to it. God's word is like a container that whatever it says and it sets out to do, it's going to do it. So we can trust and we can bank on the word of God. It holds perfection. It's true. It has integrity behind it. And so much more, it's settled in heaven and on earth. So if God says it, it's not like the world. You can believe it if God says it. Matthew 24, 35 says that heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. His word shall not pass away. That's a great thing to think about that heaven and earth, God's word, is, it holds so much integrity and strength behind it that heaven and earth will pass away, but what he says will never pass away. And we can hold on to his word in the midst of adversity, in the midst of storm. We can guarantee that if God said it, then he meant it. If we got stuff falling apart in our lives and we're not sure which way to turn, we can turn to this. We can turn to this. God has a purpose and a plan behind everything that he has and everything that he says, and we can hold on to his word. And in fact, the Bible says that his word is spirit and it's life. The word of God is spirit and it's life. John 6, 63 says it like this. He says that the spirit alone gives eternal life. Glory be to God. Man, what's dead in your life that you're looking for God to resurrect? Like Steve talked, Brother Steve talked about other, uh, earlier, it's the Holy Spirit. Man, I tell you what, like I said earlier, if we are in a church, in a building, because we are the church, it's the Christ that lives in us is what makes the church. But if we're in a building and there's no move of God in it and there's no radical change in it and if people's lives aren't be, being radically changed by the Spirit of God, this is just another social club. 
There needs to be a move of God in your life where you can feel him from the inside out. And when circumstances and, and things come in our life, we know we can raise above that because we have the spirit of God that moves and breathes and, has, and he helps us and he guides us. The Holy Spirit is more than a jiggle and just a, a goosebump. Glory be to God. The Holy Spirit is here to direct our lives. The Holy Spirit is here to remind us that when we don't know what to do, that he knows what to do. And we can depend on him and we can trust him. What's dead in our lives that we need to return back to the spirit of God and ask him to resurrect back to life? The spirit alone gives eternal life. Human efforts accomplish nothing. What are you depending on for man? to help you with. We've all been there where we put our trust in people and our trust and, and our hope and things and, and situations and circumstances and hoping that they're going to change. But we have to understand that our effort accomplishes zero. In fact, it's the work that Jesus Christ already done on the cross. We have to look to the author and the finisher of our faith when we're looking for things to come to pass in our life and we're looking for things that need to be accomplished in our life that can only be accomplished by the Spirit of God, we need to look to the author and the finisher of our faith, who is Jesus Christ. Praise God. And he goes on to say, here we go. And the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The words that Christ has spoken to us are spirit and life. Now, I can reassure you right now that no human words in this world have the integrity that God has behind his words. Because God's word has the power to change. God, God's word has the power to change our hearts, right? To change our minds, to change our situations and circumstances. Glory be to God. How many people here have a circumstance that they need changed? It's the word of God. We got to stand on his word and believe what he says. Praise God. It has the, the word of God. It penetrates. It separates. It re, here's, here's what else what it does. It reveals the true intentions of our hearts. And what it does also is it challenges our belief system. And it tears down false belief systems. What lies are you believing in this world that the enemy has conjured up that you have put a foundation under it and it's not holding? Because if it's not the word of God, it's never going to hold. If it, if, if, it, if it wasn't spoken from God, it's never going to hold. If it didn't come out of this Bible, it's not going to hold. This is what we got to depend on. Not what man says. Not a false belief system, not a government. Jesus Christ. That's who we're dependent on. Hebrews 4:12 says this: "For the word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and spirit, between the joint and marrow, and it exposes. It exposes. Darkness don't like to be exposed. Darkness wants to hide in your heart. Darkness wants to make a home in your mind and build fortresses in your mind and have you under these false belief systems and things that can't save you. And then you begin to put, put your, your trust in things instead of the Savior. And I'm not just talking about the world, I'm talking about the church talking about the church and he says it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires and that's the problem we don't want to be exposed because what exposition does it challenges us to correct and to change 
You know, it, ch it challenges us to change, to, to allow God to change the things that we want to hold on to, the things that may be tearing apart our marriages, the innermost secrets that we try to hide from everyone, and we think we're doing a good job of it, but the, here's the problem. God knows the true intents of each and every one of our hearts. So, God knows everything about us. He knows the good, he knows the bad, he knows the ugly, and watch this, he even knows the dirty. And we don't like when the dirty is exposed. Because we want to hold on to those things that are just breaking and tearing us apart. And that's what's happening in the church, church is compromise. We begin to label things as just, oh, it's just, this or that, and really, it's a, it's a spiritual issue. It's a sin issue. It's a sin issue. We can't expect to draw closer to God when we're trying to hold on to sin. Jesus didn't come here to, to have some type of an organized, traditional religion. Jesus came here for relationship. He came here that we would not be separated from God any longer, but that we, he made a way back to the Father. The perfect sacrificial lamb of God that paid the, a price that no one in here, including me, could have paid. But he gave it. He gave his life for us to be back in real right relationship. And there's so many things that come with what Jesus has done. We're, we're restored. We're revived. We're everything, man. We're justified. We're righteous. We're righteous before God. We all deserved hell. But God, but God who sent his only son. So I want to talk about three reasons why it's hard to recognize compromise. It's hard to recognize compromise sometimes. First reason is, is because Compromise is very subtle. Second reason is compromise is always mixed with some kind of crazy half-truth that the enemy decides to insert in there and then we believe it. And then we begin to walk in that, in that half-truth like it's really the truth when in fact it's a lie from the pit of hell. And here's a, the third reason. Compromise implies that we are missing something. It says that you're less than or you're lacking without something. And it always tries to exit Jesus out of the picture. That's what compromise does eventually. Eventually, that's what compromise does. So what does subtle mean? Well, subtle, it's, it's delicate or precise. Um, and it, it, it's, it's difficult to analyze or describe. And when I looked that up, I'm like, wow, that's powerful. It's difficult to analyze or describe. Making use of clever and indirect methods to achieve something. Don't that sound like the devil? That's what, that's what compromise is. It's in, in, in the wrong context, comp because we, can, we compromise with our families. We compromise with our, our, our spouses but in the wrong context, being clever and indirect and having methods, other methods, clever methods to achieve something, it's devilish. And here's, here's another thing that described it, that put it in context for me, that it's arranged in an, in, in an ingenious and elaborate way. That's what the enemy does. He arranges things in an ingenious and an elaborate way that when you, when you look at what's happened and it's already unfolded, you're like, wow, I didn't even see that coming. And you know where that comes from? We're not immersed in God. You know, that, that's the only way we can defeat this spirit of compromise from the enemy is we have to be so yielded to, the, to Jesus Christ and immersed in his presence that we can hear his voice. He says, my sheep hear my voice. And in others, they will not listen to. But we have a church that's listening to another voice. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. I want to tackle some of this really fast here. Everybody okay out there? Amen. 
chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. He says, now the serpent was more subtle, cunning, crafty, prudent, than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, yeah, have God said? There we go. Yeah, did God say? Yeah, did God say it was okay to, to deal with these people? Yeah, did God say it was okay to take this job? Yeah, did God say it was okay to move from here to there? there? You know, he, there's doubt. And he said unto the woman, Yeah, have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. Wow. For God do know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. And you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. There we go. We're lacking. We're less, less than. We're missing something. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, there we go, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. Boy, desire, desire. We got to watch what we're desiring, man. Desire. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God mm, 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 amongst the trees of the garden. So what this passage reveals to us is the reality, the, the reality of compromising the truth of God's word and what it will do to us if we're not, if we're not careful. What it does, it instills doubt. And when doubt is conceived, the enemy has room to creep in with deception because ultimately his goal is to get us to question the integrity of God's word. If he can get us to question the integrity of God's word, then he can get us into a wrong mindset of thinking what he says is truth. And we can't, we can't allow that. Take a look at the B, the B part of verse 1. He said, and he said unto the woman, yeah, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. See, what happened was the enemy presented a question of doubt to her. So this is why it's so important that we are rooted, that we are grounded, that we are established in the word of God. So that when we hear the words of the enemy, we can identify him and we can tackle him and dismiss him. And we can go back to the word of God. Look at what verse 6 says. He says that, and that it was pleasant to the eyes and the tree to be desired to make one wise. Listen, ladies and gentlemen. Sin is always, it always looks pleasant and enticing from the outside. Then when desire sets in, it will bring forth one of two actions. Either for us to flee or to yield to that desire. And if we yield to that desire, it will bring death to our lives in so many ways. Because once we're yielded to sin, what sin does, it tries to master and control us. That's the aim, that's the aim of sin. It wants to completely encompass our lives. And it wants to completely control the very depths of our being. And the end result will be death and separation from God. Separation from God. But this is what James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15 says. 
He says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord God hath promised them that love him. Let no man say that when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. But watch this. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away with, drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, I know this is a tough message, man, but it's, it's truth. It's truth, and, and that's what we, we have to hold on. We have to dismiss what is bad, and we have to cling to what is good, and the truth of it is sin has become such a natural thing to people that they call it other things, and it's not. Sin is just sin. You know, sin is sin. The Bible is really clear about things of, of sin. So, what do we do about this? Well, the first thing is we got to change our mindset. Philippians 2.5 says, let this mind be in you. Well, what mind? Which was also in Christ Jesus. See, we can't hold on to our empty thoughts. We can't hold on to the enemy's thoughts because they'll lead us astray every single time. The Bible says, he's clear. He says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But watch this. It says that he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made and being, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of cross. So what is the mind? Well, we got to stop thinking that we're more <laughs> than what God's called us to be. We got to put back ourselves and start putting people ahead of us. We have to be servants because the Son of Man came not, not to be served, but that to seek and serve and give himself a living ransom for many. So we have to... Do away with the reputation and trying to be more than what God has called us to be. We have to serve people. We have to be yielded to God. We have to submit to his ways. We have to think about the needs of others. We hear that the two greatest commandments are is that we love God and we love people. If we can't do that, that we're not accomplishing his mission and we're on our own mission. If we're not accomplishing that, we're not on his mission, we're on our own mission. Praise God. And we always want to be on his mission because that's what Jesus was on his mission. We're not greater than Jesus. But I tell you what, he sent the comforter that lives in us and his name's the Holy Spirit. And that if we turn to him, there's nothing that we can't accomplish. Because he who, is great, he who is in us is greater than he who is in this world. Praise God. So, so here's the thing. There's no doubting with Jesus. He knew exactly who he was and actually, and, and whose he was and, and where he came from. And he knew where he was going. He knew where he was going back to. And in the same way, we have to keep the same mind and the same attitude that Jesus had. And we have to even take it a step further that Jesus was also tempted in the same way that Adam and Eve was when he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, yet he did not sin. There's always a way out. There's always a way out. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 8, I want to read those real quick. He says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did not eat nothing. And when they were ended, he afterward a hungered. And the devil said unto him, if thou be the son of God, listen, it's the same equation that happened in the garden. He says, if thou be the son of God, command these stones that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him saying, 
It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The word that has integrity behind it. The word that has life behind it. The word that when you don't know what to do, that's going to sustain you through every trial or tribulation that comes your way. The word that we speak, it speaks life into our children and, and to our circumstances and situations. The things that are dead, God's word can bring them back to life. But if you don't believe that, it never will happen. See, the, the kingdom of God works off of a belief system. We have to believe, first of all, that he is who he says that he is. And he is a war, rewarded to those who diligently seek him. But you have to diligently seek him. You can't make him number two or number three on your priority list. He has to be number one. Numero uno. Numero uno, because why? He deserves it. He is God. And that's going to come from us yielding and submitting to the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, we can't do this. I'll, I'll say this again. We cannot do this walk without the Holy Spirit. If you're thinking that we, you're going to go through life without the power of God living in you and being just a, a Christian, the devil's going to have his way with you, with your family, every single time. We need the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. And he says that man shall not live by, by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. One translation says that it's from the mouth of God. And Matthew 4, 4 says it like this. He says, it's what I said, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So just from these two verses alone, we can see why the enemy is after the integrity of God's word. He wants to discount it. He wants us to discount God's word. He wants us to doubt it. And he does not want us to depend on God's word because he knows that the word of God is life. God's word is life, and it brings life to each and every one of our situations and circumstances. So, in conclusion... I want to read John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And this is really going to put everything in perspective about the word of God. And he says that in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehended it not. Why do you think there's such an attack on the word of God in the world? Why? Because the light shineth in darkness, and darkness comprehends it not. You see, the Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man. There's a way that seems right to a man, but to the end, there is destruction. So if we continue to go to the way that seemeth right to a man, and we wonder why everything around us is falling apart, you got to go back to God's word. Because if you're looking for the right way, this is it. I don't care what, what system you try to go through, what, what agency, what, what, it's like I tell people all the time. And I'll tell you a little bit about my past. I mean, I, I, man, drug addiction, uh, prison, countless times of jail, overdoses. I've been all around the United States trying to find out who I was, and I didn't find out who I was till I found out who he was. And when I found out who he was, it changed the inside of me. See, systems can't do that. AA couldn't do it. NA couldn't do it. And AAA sure can't do it. 
So I don't care what system or what program you think that's going to do it. It's not going to do it because it's a heart condition. And that heart condition can only be changed by the power of the Holy Spirit that works within us. And I'm telling you right now, if we submit and we give our lives to God, he can change everything in our lives that we think we, that we think that'll never be changed. Those kids you think that are so far gone, God's calling them home. I prophesy that over each and every person at the sound of my voice, that the Holy Spirit is moving in your circumstances. The Holy Spirit is bringing them home. Those marriages that you think that are far too gone, God's healing those marriages. At the sound of my voice right now, the Holy Spirit is working in to do what is impossible for man, but is greatly possible for God. So I would like to encourage each and every person here today, stand on God's word. It's not popular. No, it's not popular. The word of God challenges people. The word of God is it does something inside of you. So you're either going to submit to it and yield to it, or you're going to want to run to the way that seemeth right to a man. But it's destruction. It's a lie from the pit of hell. God changed my life radically, radically. It was a process, but I'm telling you, when the, fire, when the power of the Holy Spirit started working inside of me, man, I'm telling you, he radically changed me. The person you see now, I was not the same person three, four years ago. I was lost. I was troubled. I was living so far in sin, I, didn't, I couldn't see a way out. I couldn't see a way up. But God. And, and it wasn't, it, he, didn't, he didn't do this for me, he did it for him, and that others might come to a saving knowledge of who he is through the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. So we all have a testimony. So I would like to encourage everyone here today, stand on the word of God, even when it's not popular, even when it, because the enemies, there's always going to be opposition, Enemy is always going to want to oppose the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ because Romans says it's the power of God unto sal salvation to everyone who believes. Anyone who believes. This gospel is not for just for blacks. This gospel is not just for whites. This gospel is not just for red, green, purple, or yellow. This gospel is for everyone that believes. Everyone. So if you have false ideologies, if you think that, that your belief system, that you can conform God to your belief system, whether it's racism, I don't care what it is, you better open this word and let God conform you to the truth. Because that's what this word does. It exposes the lies of the enemy and it builds truth in your heart. And then when you start to walk in the manifest presence of God in your life, I'm telling you, you're going to start to see a change, not only in you, but in everyone around you. Praise God. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for this word, Lord. We thank you for who you are, Jesus. You're such a good God. We are here for you, Lord. And we just ask, Lord, that if anybody's out there that, that just is looking for a change, Lord, we call you up right now in the mighty name of Jesus. If you want to make a, a step of faith, if you're looking for a change, Marilyn, thank you. If you're looking for a change, if you're looking for a renewal of your life, if you're looking for a renewal of your marriage, if you need prayer, if you need the Holy Spirit to touch you in a way that you've never had him touch you before, I would like you to come up here right now and let God touch you. Because he will. He loves you. He wants to change you. I don't care how old you are. You're never too old for a touch of God in your life. Come to me, he says. Oh, you are weary and who are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Come to God and let him give you rest. Let him touch your heart. 
we'll pray for you. I have prayer warriors here today. Thank you, Jesus, for this day. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made. You've drawn us back to right relationship. Lord, nobody else could have done it but you. Who else but Jesus? You deserve the glory and the honor. Touch our lives, Lord. Lord, and even for the ones that don't come up, Lord, I speak life into their situations in Jesus' name. I speak peace into their lives in Jesus' name. I speak resurrection into their lives in Jesus' name. I say in the name of Jesus, you devil, you take your hands off of them. They're not yours, but they're his. For the ones who are lost, the children, Lord, draw them back to you, Jesus. Touch them to the very depths of their souls, Lord. It's not your will that any should perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of who you are, Jesus. And we thank you, Lord. You're just so kind and so good to us. Where would we be without you? Where would we be without you, Jesus? Touch us all, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your precious name we pray. If there anybody needs to touch from God, I would, I would like to come on up. If you need prayer, if you have lost loved ones, if you need healing in your marriage, if you need healing in your heart, I would like to extend an invitation for you to come up here so we can pray for you, so we can anoint you with oil. If you just need a, a rejuvenation in your life, God can do it. He can do it. But you have to expect him to be Lord. You have to call on his name. He wants to. God wants to touch your situation. Trust me, he does. Trust me, he does. We'll be here. I'll be here a little bit after the service. And uh, just trust him. Trust his word. He wants to pour so much into your lives and into your hearts. Doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your background is. God loves you. He loves you. Thank you.